Good evening. I'm Lisa Broom with the CBC Evening News. In our top story tonight, employees at the Supreme Court still have no idea where they'll be working from, while officials tackle a buildup of mold in the complex. Word of this from Registrar Barbara Cook Aline after a meeting with stakeholders this morning. Well, despite the uncertainty, she says plans are in place to give workers at least one more day to deal with pressing matters. A cloud of uncertainty still hovers over operations at the Bridgetown Supreme Court. That's after a number of stakeholders, including Registrar Barbara Cook Allen, Attorney General Adriel Brathwit, and union officials, met to discuss a solution to the mold infested facility. After a short meeting with staff, the Registrar revealed that Monday would be the last day for operations at the building until the environment is safe. On Monday, the staff has agreed to come in to finish up matters. So persons who were supposed to collect certificates on 11th, 12th, 30th and 16th, be it birth, marriage or death, can come in on Monday morning at 9 to collect those. We'll only be doing urgent certificates after that until we've relocated. What's unclear at this point is where the 185 court employees will be housed. We are looking to relocate. So we're looking for places to relocate to. So that's one of the first things on the agenda. We've not found that place as yet. It's a massive place to relocate. So we're looking at that. We're going to meet again on Tuesday morning. By then we've visited certain sites to see where we'll be going and meet with the staff again. The registrar refused to place a timeline on how long workers would be out of office. That's despite a three-month time period announced by the unions. It's not dangerous at the station side. We just want to clean the building completely. That's why we're moving. We don't want to clean with the staff in there. The safety and health concern. But we need to move and get this done one time properly. So it won't happen again. Okay. Ms. Cook Aline also promised to engage the Barbados Bar Association in the process after the association's president, Lisa Weeks, revealed that lawyers were in the dark after Wednesday's walkout. Up to the time of this report, Ms. Weeks was unable to comment on the most recent developments. There's also no word on whether union officials are satisfied as efforts to reach them have been unsuccessful. Kareem Smith, CBC News. Thanks, Kareem. As Barbadians get closer to election season, the Democratic Labour Party is warning Barbadians to beware of fake news. This as an edited version of a poster for a community rally featuring candidate for Christchurch East Central and Minister of Education Ronald Jones and DLP candidate for St. Michael Southeast Rodney Grant has been making the rounds on social media. Well, the DLP's poster has been tampered with to include the tagline, Help us by your vote. General Secretary of the DLP and a new St. John candidate, George Pilgrim, condemned those responsible for the act. He says fake news is hurting the country. We want to distance ourselves from any attempt to associate the Democratic Labour Party with giving free Hennessy or an ad which suggests that the Democratic Labour Party has running, is running a promotion on a campaign that says, buy your vote. <laughs> I've had several calls about this ad. Minister Ronald Jones revealed there have been other attempts to disrupt operations in his constituency. He called on those responsible for the vandalism of the poster to cease and desist from such actions. And rather than seeking legal recourse, he appealed for good sense and morals to prevail. The most thing about the, the internet and all of these things is you're supposed to be anonymous. You're supposed to be hiding behind the shadows. There are some who don't hide behind the shadows. They come out in their own name, with their address, their phone number, and they do or some of this as well. In instances like that, if you want to track it down, you so can. But it becomes a nuisance. You would have so many to track down and to find and to clog up the system and to clog up the course. That's not what we really want. A former trade unionist believes there is a deliberate attempt to convince people that Barbados is a failing state or well on its way to becoming one. 
This suggestion from retired Deputy General Secretary of the Barbados Workers' Union, Ulrich Seeley. He says characteristics of a failed state include widespread corruption and crime, the inability of a government to provide public services, and sharp economic decline, none of which he has seen in Barbados. He backed his suggestions with findings from a recent study done on state fragility on which Barbados ranked low. Number one is the highest. One, seven is the least. Barbados 139. Yet many of the so-called right-thinking, socio-economic and political commentators in our midst would want us to believe otherwise. The tone of their speeches and the style of their writings are all geared towards the fomenting of doubt and disenchantment in the minds of others. Mr. Seeley made the comment at this week's Astor B. Watts lunchtime lecture, where he spoke on the topic developing a post-colonial state and the sterling work of the DLP. Now, while agreeing that there's always room for improvement, he says the party has made a lasting contribution across a, multi a multitude of sectors, including tourism, human capital development and manufacturing. The Democratic Labour Party was responsible for moving the Barbadian economy from total dependence on sugar-based agriculture to a more balanced economy with the development of the manufacturing and tourism sectors. By 1976, 15,000 Barbadian men and women were gainfully employed in manufacturing. Industrial estates and parks were open at Grisettes, the Harbour, Vinley, Newton, Seville, and Six Crossroads. This industrialization shift opened the floodgates for employment for women, young and old. The effects of these policies are still being felt today. Well, there's lots more to come on the CBC Evening News, so stay tuned. Recent attacks by dogs, including strays on livestock, have cost farmers a pretty penny. The attacks have prompted the Barbados Agriculture Society to call for action as the livelihood of farmers is being affected. According to Chief Executive Officer James Paul, there has been a resurgence in the stray dog population, coupled with the reckless practice of some owners to let these animals out at night. We have had reports of sheep being attacked. Um, we've even had a recent, a recent evidence of, of um, cows being attacked by packs of stray dogs. We know that the, 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 the veterinary persons of the ministry are doing their best to control the stray dog population in this country. But we have to ask those persons who have animals and who, for some reason or the other, cannot control them, refer them to the relevant authorities instead of letting them out. Mr. Paul also says opportunities exist for growth in the agriculture sector, but all of the related sectors need to cooperate. In terms of trying to ensure that the market that should be available to farmers when they have locally produced product that that market is available. And the only way that can happen is if we have a closer working relationship between our sectors and that is where the BS in itself will be striving to maintain that relationship with other members of the private sector in order to try to ensure that where there are opportunities for local production that, we, that local farmers take full advantage of it rather than importing those commodities, which all they will do is cause stress. Research conducted by the General Insurance Association of Barbados has revealed that of the estimated 8,000 accidents yearly, about 3,000 are due to distracted driving. There's a lot of accidents. And when that research also told us that for every accident on average, the insurance companies are paying out seven thousand dollars. Seven thousand by by three thousand is is quite a bit of change. So uh, it is in our interest, obviously, then to assist with this matter as we we seek to reduce both the number of 
minor accidents, the number of, of major accidents, and more importantly, the number of accidents where there's loss of life. For over seven years, she was known nationally as the voice for local fisher folk. But Barbadians got to learn more about the personal life of the late Angela Watson, such as her positive attributes and community spirit, when she was laid to rest yesterday. More in this report. A fearless Christian and community-minded individual are just some of the descriptions given of the late Angela Watson. Reverend Dr. Marcus Lashley says she was a true Christian soldier who refused to back down from any spiritual threats. He highlighted one instance of drug landings near to churches which affected attendance at nightly services as many Christians were too scared to leave home. Some church meetings were also affected during that time for fear of the churches being torched. However, Angela defied those odds, helping to organize a meeting spot for Christians. A soldier is prepared always to die for his cause. And my response was, if they burn it down, let them burn it down. We'll build another church. But a building cannot stand in the work of the church. We are the church, not the building. We can meet in here, Father. We can meet outside under a tent. We will still be St. Mark's. The building does not define us. And the building should not limit our ministry. And I knew that. And she said to me, don't worry. And she took the keys of Sussex and opened the door. And we met in the pavilion at Sussex. Hundreds who packed in and outside of the church hall reflected the many lives she touched. Nephew Camille Watson says she treated everyone like family and often gave freely. I know quite a few of you remember me when I was small. I was very protective and caring of my auntie Anne. And everybody used to want to call my auntie Anne them auntie Anne. I used to have a problem with it. But I think today I can rest assured knowing that everybody was Anne's niece or nephew. And Anne was everybody's auntie, godmother caregiver, advice giver, everything. She was everything for everybody. She put everybody before herself. In his eulogy, John Goddard said Miss Watson genuinely loved people and never sought any recognition for her positive deeds. Many people force themselves on the public stage in search of accolades. Angela Watson did what she did because she felt God had called her to serve and she could make a difference in the lives of ordinary folk. Honors and awards did not motivate her. All she ever wanted to do was to follow Christ's command to love her brothers and sisters as she loved herself. The service included tributes and song from Tony Grisette and other community groups which Miss Watson supported. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Ryan Broom, CBC News. And the local broadcast community is in mourning following the death of veteran broadcaster Vic Brewster. Mr. Brewster died at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital last night at the age of 81 after ailing for some time. Lisa Lord reports. Today we're paying a visit to the Barbados Met Office at the Grant Lee Adams International Airport. Vic Buddy Boy Brewster was made for broadcast. He joined the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation on December 15, 1963 as a radio operator after a stint at the former Barbados Radio Fusion. He became the first Barbadian to operate and announce at the same time. Mr. Brewster would hold many other positions over the years, including television producer, director and presenter. He was well known for many programs like Break with Brewster, What's My Line, Stump the Panel, Studio Party, Bust Your Brain, Opportunity Knocks, Spotlight and others. Errol Rawlings worked with Mr. Brewster for close to 20 years and called him a pioneer. Buddy Boy, uh, as we call him Buddy Boy, uh, loved broadcasting and he loved a good joke too. Um, he really contributed much to what broadcasting is now. Uh, 
to me, he was the consummate broadcaster. He was responsible for producing and directing quite a lot of material for early radio and television, um, while at the same time he was very popular in the nightclubs as uh, an MC, And that is ranging from back in the late 60s through the 90s, I, I think. He was very popular. And real radio is concerned, he had, I would think, one of the largest audiences at that time. Retired broadcaster Claude Graham, whose work relationship with Mr. Booster spanned several decades, says his personality made work fun. When I went to CBC August 1st, 1966, he was already well established as one of the leading broadcasters in the entire Caribbean region. I worked with him on some of his signature assignments, you may call them that. Break with Brewster Studio Party. He was a kind of fun character, always smiling, and that served to be contagious as it made, made the work that we did with him uh, most enjoyable. And it wasn't all broadcast for Mr. Brewster, as he was also a top MC and comedian on the hotel and nightclub circuit. Some nights, the versatile personality would do four shows and then report for work at CBC first thing the next morning. Among his most popular shows were those at the Island Inn on Monday nights and at the Caribbean Pepper Pot with the Merry Men. CBC's general manager, Doug Hoyt, in extending condolences, shared his memories of Mr. Brewster. Big Brewster was the consummate broadcast professional. Uh, he was a stickler for details from his early days on radio as Barbados' first bona fide disc jockey to his transition to television. He did it his way, but he did it correctly. Rest well, buddy boy. Many of the island's outstanding personalities in radio and television would have been trained by Mr. Brewster. He retired from the CBC on October 1st, 2001. Let's start with the CBC team. Lisa Lord, CBC News. And the Barbados Association of Journalists has remembered Mr. Brewster as one whose work was defined by a craftiness with words, a wit and sense of humor, as well as a professionalism that was pinned on the love for the media. Now, President, uh, interim president of the BAJ, Amanda Lynch Foster, joins us live now. Amanda, it's not under the best of circumstances, but welcome anyway. Thank you so much. Now, we were just hearing about uh, Mr. Brewster's love for the media, and I'm sure uh, the association is one that he would have given his full support to. It certainly was a blow to wake up and hear about his death this morning. Yes, it was really sad news to wake up to. And as you said, he had a genuine love for the media. And we loved him back. Um, for many young journalists, or even not so young <laughs> journalists, he was someone that we would have looked up to. He really helped shape um, what we thought of as the media landscape and broadcasting in Barbados when Barbados was becoming independent and becoming a nation of its own. Mm -hmm. So he was really an icon in that way. And one of the things that we've heard today from quite a lot of um, journalists is his passion for mentoring and making sure that he passed on the high standards that he held himself to, to other young journalists and reporters and announcers. So he will genuinely be missed by Certainly. the media fraternity. Certainly. I can attest to that as well, having been trained um, by Mr. Brewster myself. Now, we are also talking about the Association of Journalists yes. and the <laughs> fact that the association will be relaunched this weekend. Yes, so indeed. Tell us some more about that. Okay, I'm happy to. Um, the Barbados Association of Journalists, we are having our official relaunch and a special general meeting this Sunday, April 15th. It's going to be held at the NUPW headquarters in Dalkeith Road and starting at 4 p.m. The association has been dormant for a number of years. This is not the first time it has gone through um, peaks and valleys, <laughs> let's say. Um, so the association has been restarted. There was an informal meeting in mid-February that a number of people attended. And at that time, it was decided, look, we want to get the association going again. We had a discussion about some of the things that we would do differently based on what we learned from our experiences the last time, what worked, what didn't work. And so... We put together a small interim committee, myself, Emmanuel Joseph, and Marlon Madden from um, Barbados Today, Ryan Broom and Anne-Marie Burke from here at CBC. The five of us, we've been working 
um, with the mandate that we got from the people that were at that meeting to go forward and get the organization restarted. So the official relaunch is this Sunday. Um, Al Jiltz is going to be the featured speaker at the relaunch, but before the relaunch, there's going to be the special general meeting where we're going to have elections to have to elect a full committee because the full committee should be eight people. So we're going to have elections to um, get choose a full executive so that we can go forward with the work of the association. Now, given um, the fact that you are about to have uh, to open up the BAJ's doors, so to speak, to, mm -hmm. to other to members, is it going to be an association just for journalists, as the name suggests, the name now suggests, or will it be open to other uh, media workers? I'm so glad you asked that. That is actually one of the things that was discussed at the informal meeting in February and something that has come up from time to time over the years because when the organization was last active um, between 2008 and about 2012 and I was president for part of that time that was something that we would get a question about all the time we would get it from sub editors and copy editors at the newspapers we would get it from photographers and videographers well does it, does it apply to me do I qualify or is it just people who are the journalists we get it from announcers and the Constitution has always made it clear that it in that it includes all media workers who are involved in the production of news so that's an announcer, the production and distribution of news. So that's announcers, that's, um, you know, that's uh, sub-editors, sub -editors, that is videographers, that's photographers and so on, producers and so on. But we think that we need to make the name more inclusive and to make it clear that it is the Barbados Association of Journalists and Media Workers. So there is a motion, there are several um, constitutional amendments that are going to be discussed at the special general meeting. And one of them is to change the name so that it is more inclusive so it'll be either the Barbados Association of Journalists and Media Workers or Barbados Association of Media Workers so that is on the table for Sunday because we it, it doesn't make sense to to be exclusive and to only have just journalists alone we really need the strength of everyone that is involved in this news business now one of the things people talk about um, is how I don't know maybe tranquil is a word that, that I might use here mm -hmm. um, the climate for journalism in Barbados is we don't have situations like other places where mm -hmm. journalists are under threat for <coughs> doing their jobs so it appears as though the climate is you know is good and calm are you satisfied that uh, jur journalists are having as strong a voice as they need to have to, to make their presence felt I'm glad that the climate is tranquil right now. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to complain about that. Certainly when the association restarted the last time, in right at the end of 2008, there were a number of incidents yes. with between the police force and the, and the media fraternity. Um, some journalists were charged, one from CBC, one from The Nation, mm -hmm. and that was really kind of the the spur for getting us restarted the last time. I'm glad that this time we're not starting in a situation of crisis. However, the media environment is good, but it could always be better. Mm -hmm. There is, I would say, a creeping suspicion or a lack of respect for the profession. And we would have heard the report earlier about fake news. And it's so hard now in this day and age, you know, you have, you don't have necessarily obvious physical threats, but the threats that you're getting to the profession and to the integrity of the profession may be electronic threats because mm -hmm. how do people tell the difference between real news and produced by journalists yeah. who have standards that they are trained. holding trained for and mm -hmm. holding themselves to as opposed to people who are just disseminating whatever comes across their mind and sending it out across their phone mm -hmm. so that that is one of the things that the association is going to be focusing very heavily on going forward is just upholding standards and making that clear to the public and i'm hoping you'll be discussing as well this quote quote unquote mm -hmm. lack of investigative journalism in barbados yes that is something <laughs> that we are willing to take on it's not necessarily something that I personally agree with. Mm -hmm. I see investigative journalism, but I don't think the public necessarily has a full understanding. What people think of as investigative journalism is often an expose, so they want documents that fell off a truck, right. as opposed to an issue that may be painstakingly, you draw the pieces of the story in many, many, many stories over the course of time. That is investigative journalism as well, exploring all of the angles of a particular issue mm -hmm. and bringing out something that may be hidden in the mass of facts, not necessarily hidden because somebody's trying to hide it. So that is one of the things that we are going to address, but it's important to have the media association there as a strong voice for authentic, genuine journalism by trained journalists. 
Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Amanda Lynch Foster, the interim president of the Barbados Association of Journalists. I'll still to come a look at some of the stories making headlines across the region. A new session of the Antigua and Barbuda government has begun nearly a month after Prime Minister Gaston Brown led his Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party to victory at the polls. He's promising a new era of socio-economic development. Governor General Rodney Williams, delivering the traditional throne speech, cautioned that 2018 would be a year of decision-making and that the investment climate there is getting better. He said the World Bank's ease of doing business finds that while Antigua and Barbuda is ahead of a number of CARICOM countries, there are still obstacles to overcome. And the Governor General said the government would put in place policies to allow for medical marijuana products to be sold there. He said the plants will be grown, harvested and processed for the exclusive purpose of turning the vegetation into medicines that will be sold in Antigua and Barbuda only for domestic use by residents and visitors. Trinidad and Tobago's government will be appealing the High Court ruling that was handed down yesterday, stating that the buggery law is unconstitutional. The, amendment, the announcement, that is, was made by Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, Stuart Young. The High Court ruled it unconstitutional to impede on the rights of homosexual men, a challenge that was brought against the state in 2017 by gay rights activist Jason Jones. Well, the Rastafarian and Muslim communities have spoken out against the ruling. Trinidad is a place of a lot of macho men. So I know since when all your men reach that stage that, that all you want to have a next man and man is there. But even you do that, that is your privilege. As far as Islam is concerned, in the privacy of your house, you could do what you want. And, and, and even if, uh, if you are part of the society, that is also your right. But when it comes to legislating against the laws of Allah, no go. No go. Rastafarian Gabriel Selassie joined his Muslim colleagues outside of the Hall of Justice. He was clear as to what he wanted and what he didn't. Based on God said, a man is not to lie, watch it. If a man lies with a man, as one lies with a woman, both of them have done the abominable act. What cause and effect is the law of nature, Port Royal Sink, you know. So the man go more burnt to ashes, you know. Cause and effect is the law of nature. The government need to know what they are doing concerning this. This is very serious. This is not a joke, you know. Colin Robinson, however, sees it differently. My understanding of what it means is, first of all, that the state will appeal, and this will go all the way to the Privy Council before the judgment is final. What it means to me, and it's really humbling, I think the, what the laws, the buggery laws, have done is not prevent or punish sex, but punish our ability to imagine that what happened today could have happened, that the law could provide us with justice. We'll give you a peek into the world of sports in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, here is a tip from Cooperators General Insurance. This tip of the day is brought to you by Cooperators General Insurance Company Limited. Insurance the way you want it to be. People with disabilities are interested in the same topics of conversation in which people without disabilities are interested. This tip brought to you in association with the Barbados Council for the Disabled.